Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Working with Medicaid Managed Care Organizations to Ensure Equitable Access to Advanced Primary Care, made possible by the Commonwealth Fund. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, audio lines are muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session during today's presentation. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. A brief online evaluation will pop up on your screen following today's event. The feedback is very important to us and we hope that you'll take a moment to complete this survey. I'll now turn the webinar over to Diana Crumley, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thank you, Travis. So I am so excited to be here today to talk about accountability in Medicaid managed care with a specific focus on primary care and health equity. So we're gonna start off with some of the basics of primary care access. How do we think about safety net providers when we think about primary care access? How do we hold managed care organizations accountable in contracts? Then we'll move on to equity in care delivery and transformation. And then we'll end it with a state perspective, specifically with mass health. There'll be a robust discussion and question and answer session after three presentations. Next slide. So a little bit about the Center for Healthcare Strategies. We're a policy and implementation partner. We specialize in Medicaid and we think a lot about equity and effective models for prevention and care delivery and solutions for policies and programs. Next slide. So this is the last of a series of webinars on the strengthening primary care through Medicaid managed care initiative. Each of these beautiful pictures here with a check mark means that there's a webinar that is associated with that topic. Those are all available on our website for download and viewing. You can see slides, you can see the presentations. And today, again, we'll be focusing on promoting accountability for Medicaid managed care organizations. Next slide. Now, each of those pictures on the last slide also corresponds to a written module. And uh, th those modules are in a toolkit uh, for states. Traditionally, our focus has been on state Medicaid managed care programs, state Medicaid agencies interested in using their Medicaid managed care contracts as powerful tools to advance care delivery transformation. So you can see modules on uh, managed care accountability, but also things like team-based care, uh, addressing health-related social needs, all with example RFP language, example contract language. So for those busy state Medicaid folks um, that are putting together their 300, 400 page documents that have easy examples of how to advance primary care innovation and promote health equity in their programs. Next slide. And here's a little taste of what you might see in one of those modules. So these are the accountability mechanisms, um, often financially oriented in Medicaid managed care. So we have a large table with different types of tools available to states. For example, incentive and withhold arrangements, rate adjustments, liquidated damages and penalties, auto assignment. You know, these seem dry, but in reality, they can be powerful tools for states to define targets associated with primary care innovation and hold MCOs accountable to these goals. We also have a deep dive on how you can classify MCO expenditures relating to health-related social needs. We've been providing TA to three um, in, in the past three years to a number of states, 12, uh, 12 states in total. And this is an area of typical interest um, to them. Next slide. 
So we have some wonderful presenters for you today. First, we have Sarah Rosenbaum, Professor of Health Law and Policy at the Milken Institute of School of Public Health at George Washington University. We have Sarah Coombs, Director for Health System Transformation at the National Partnership for Women and Families. And Martha Farlow, Deputy Director of Payment and Care Delivery Innovation at MassHealth. Next slide. So I'll start with Sarah Rosenbaum. And uh, if you know Medicaid, uh, you probably know Sarah Rosenbaum. She has a long history of um, devoting her career to health justice for medically underserved populations. She's a professor, a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. And she served on CDC Director's Advisory Committee and Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice and was a founding uh, commissioner of Congress's Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, which she chaired from January 2016 through April 2017. I'll hand it to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Diana, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with everybody today. Uh, uh, of course, Diana didn't tell you the most important thing, which is that Sarah and uh, Martha are both graduates of GW's Excellent Health Policy Program, uh, so I can vouch for their brilliance and, the, and, and their training. Uh, anyway, thank you for, for having us today, and I'm going to use my time uh, to actually highlight two studies. I, I've been working on Medicaid managed care issues since well, really, since the mid-1970s, when we still knew managed care as prepaid health plans uh, uh, in their very earliest incarnation, uh, through the time that Congress dramatically expanded states' tools for building managed care systems, uh, and of course, up through the 1990s, when we saw states most states by today, of course, convert themselves uh, into um, managed care systems uh, that really uh, uh, through which they operate uh, their Medicaid program. Uh, and it's been a dramatic transformation. I think it is very underreported uh, and underappreciated. It, it actually parallels the same transformation that went on in, in the private insurance market, but um, very different because state Medicaid programs owing to the poverty and the complex health needs of their patients uh, and the enormous numbers of interactions with community programs and supports that Medicaid has to have really have had to build systems of care. Uh, uh, most of us in, in, in insurance plans, unless you happen to be a member of something like Kaiser Permanente, are members of plans that offer us a network at discounted prices, but they're relatively on shaped. Uh, uh, in the case of Medicaid managed care, uh, our first observation and our first big study, which came, which began about 30 years ago now, um, uh, was that states are doing the almost unthinkable, which is having to buy entire healthcare systems. So we've sort of watched the states mature through this process. Uh, and it's been really the, 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 I would say the most important work of my, my career. So this, this today, I'm talking about two studies. Um, one done for the Commonwealth Fund on primary care and Medicaid managed care more generally. And the second one funded by Arnold Ventures that focuses specifically on family planning uh, and Medicaid managed care. So let's take a look at, uh, at the slides. Go ahead and put up the next slide. So um, these are the two studies, the Arnold Ventures study, the Commonwealth study, uh, and actually um, a, a third piece that was really not a managed care study per se, but an overview of of the uh, managed care safety net provider, uh, Medicaid managed care safety net provider relationship, uh, which is a long-standing one, and some of our key findings are found in these um, in these slides as well. Uh, the analytic method is obviously a deep dive into the contracts. Um, we have over the years posted 
databases um, uh, in their uh, original form so that you can actually look at the language of the contracts uh, as well as um, uh, get a general overview of, of what state contracts do and do not do. Uh, and we always supplement our analytic work with official interviews in order to try and learn more about when states decide to do a very deep and particularized drive dive on an issue uh, and lay out uh, quite detailed specifications in their contracts. And when they decide to step back, express their uh, goals and objectives in more general terms and allow plans to sort of vary uh, how they approach a particular issue and bring more innovation uh, uh, to that issue. And this is a fascinating topic. It's not clear to me ever which one gets you better results. Uh, it's one of the things we've tried to, to, to learn along the way. Uh, the empirical research um, uh, just simply has never materialized around this, although I've tried to interest people over, over decades now. Uh, but there are many, many reasons from a legal perspective, I'm a lawyer, to be either very specific or or uh, more deferential to, to plans. So let's um, take a look at some of the key findings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the primary care study essentially told us what you already know and what CHCS is so adept at, at teaching as well, which is um, that primary care is absolutely the foundation of all of these contracts. I mean, it just is, it always has been, this hasn't changed in all these years. Uh, and the reason it's worth noting is because primary care access is so difficult for so many poor communities, whether they are rural communities or inner city communities or special populations um, within a broader geographic area who face access barriers. And so for a Medicaid agency to have to build a managed care system uh, based on the on the ground conditions that it's that it's dealing with quickly brings most agencies um, uh, 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 brings them quickly to the understanding that they um, want to be able to use their managed care po purchasing power to try and improve the accessibility and quality of primary care. And I find that some of these basic points are the ones that we have to remind ourselves of most often, which is a Medicaid agency that 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 uses managed care has basically committed itself to improving primary care um, because that's what its whole system is going to depend on. Um, we find, of course, and th this reflects the regulations, actually, that certain issues are always addressed. Um, uh, and this is true before the 2016 overhaul of the managed care rule. If I have my year right, it was either 2015 or 2016. And true prior to or following the 2020 revision to the managed care rule, that states always address certain issues. Um, they have to, they must, their own procurement rules would require it, their own sense of access would require it. Some are much more detailed than others, and you can see the variation at the Commonwealth site. Um, other things like performance measurement tend to vary widely, and, and what varies widely is how much the states commit to their contractual documents, um, how much uh, is there at the time that the plan might sign the documents as opposed to being provided later. And, and again, I always attribute this to differences in the way state procurement systems work and what has to show, what doesn't have to show. Uh, there's obviously not a state out there since a state must do this um, uh, that is not focused on performance um, and, and, and quality improvement. It's a, it's a basic feature of, of managed care. Um, there is um, a huge amount of variation, as I noticed, noted, um, uh, among the states and even within a single state contract, there's this variation between very detailed expectations um, and contractor discretion. So one example, I didn't want to take up a lot of time on these examples, but one that leaps to mind is um, is is the state of California, which in its 2018 contract, which is what we we're what we were using, has a very 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 detailed um, tool that it expected its contractors to use when doing initial intake assessments, social risk assessments of adult 
and members. Um, Indiana, by contrast, as I recall, is Indiana used just said we want you to do a risk assessment and obviously left much more discretion to to the contractors. Um, uh, it might provide guidance, um, but as a contractual matter, uh, it was it was deferential to the to the plans. Um, next slide. Um, from the family planning study. Um, there were a number of really notable findings and findings um, of particular concern to us, given the current situation, the current climate, uh, the kind of decision from the Supreme Court we're expecting in uh, any, any day now. Um, uh, that could alter the abortion landscape and make access to high quality family planning absolutely essential. Uh, every state includes family planning as a basic service. And that is a surprise in and of itself because uh, the statute, the Medicaid statute actually carves family planning out of uh, normal managed care rules um, uh, and, 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 and makes clear that no matter what you're enrolled in as a member, you have the right to see the provider, the Medicaid participating provider of your choice. Um, so states could have said, well, you know, we'll just leave this out of the contract entirely, let people um, get care where they prefer to get care uh, and not treat it as part of an integrated delivery uh, strategy. And they did not. Family planning is part of every state's integrated deli delivery strategy. However, federal guidelines that, quite frankly, um, are really problematic at this point. They are ambiguous. They are limited. They are incomplete. Um, and they leave a lot of uncertainty about what is a family planning service and therefore what is covered by the freedom of choice requirement um, and what the federal government um, expects will be treated as a family planning service, which services qualify for the enhanced 90% payment level, which um, is not an issue for the expansion populations if you're an expansion state. It's a huge issue for children uh, and for traditional Medicaid populations um, whose care is not covered by the special enhancement FMAP. Um, very few contracts provide members um, tell plans they have to provide members with a lot of information about family planning, particularly their right to get care from the provider of choice. And many providers tell us that they have a lot of trouble with the plans um, getting paid for services because everybody's confused about what's a family planning service and therefore covered by the exemption. Uh, and services absolutely crude. I mean, we're not talking frou-frou here. We're talking about things like treatment of an STI. Uh, we are in, of course, if you follow public health data, we are in a we are in an STI uh, uh, epidemic right now. And even something as simple as getting treated for the STI is not covered by the 90% enhancement and not subject to the freedom of choice protection. Um, uh, most contracts are silent on family planning specific access and network capability standards. States grapple with performance measures, but they're they're struggling, um, and it's hard, it's very hard uh, because you don't want measures that in any way undermine the 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 the, the basic fact that this is a voluntary service. Um, but you do want measures that somehow are going to capture whether the plan even given the, 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 the complexities of family planning, is doing the best job possible with its populations. Um, next slide, please. Um, a couple of final findings, and then I will stop. The two major um, challenges we noted, um, uh, and we noted this based on our work over the years with family planning providers, uh, I mean, with uh, primary care providers, and particularly community health centers, is contracts that allow the plans to do selective purchasing from safety net providers. I mean, the, as the, the Commonwealth analysis lays out, that they make the whole thing possible. They make the managed care enterprise possible because they provide primary care where there is none. Um, and many of them, like a community health center, provide a huge array, typically, of primary care. Um, but may find that the plans are only selectively purchasing, and that creates problems because, of course, they can't deny 
the other services they offer to fam to, to manage care members. These are fam these are eligible patients of theirs. Uh, and so the amount of uncovered and unreimbursed care um, can, can be quite problematic. Um, the other issue, which, uh, which obviously is a huge issue now, and I was very interested in CHCS work around this, is um, how do we recognize um, uh, community health improvement issues when we're talking about safety net providers? Our own um, theory is that we have to come up with a with an incentive that gets oh, out and above performance for individual members or individual patients because these providers anchor care. They anchor care uh, and care related services in communities that otherwise would be medically underserved. And so we have suggested something that takes into account what we call sort of a community health anchoring role that safety net providers um, uh, play because of course they, they cannot select their patients. They are obligated to serve everybody in the community regardless of insurance status at the time, which has important spillover effects uh, on the health of low-income populations um, uh, and therefore on the Medicaid program and Medicaid managed care. So those are our big recommendations, which I'm happy to come back to. And I think that's it for our slides. Oh, no, here, the final one, we'll, which we'll talk more about, I actually noted these issues along the way. Um, uh, the uh, correction of this long-standing set of problematic federal family planning guidelines, um, clear guidance around the scope of services, what's subject to freedom of choice, what is a family planning service, um, clarity on things like utilization management. Can you ever use utilization management for family planning services and when? Um, and of course, payment reform um, uh, and quality improvement focused on uh, building stronger family planning networks. I should note that that contrary to where they might have been 30 or 40 years ago, family planning providers understand they want to be in network. They don't want to be out of network. They, they, they're accessible out of network, but except I think except in one state uh, where a clear a bright line has been drawn between family planning providers and managed care systems, um, the providers very much want to be in network and are very much trying to build integration as their own goal. Uh, so how do we strengthen that integration? And then, of course, on the safety net provider contracting, contracts that cover all covered services that safety net providers offer, and a community health equity incentive, not just incentive of payments for specific populations. So that I think is it. Thank you so much, Sarah. You have a wonderful way of reminding states that they have to think about the basics. Um, and so I am so excited to uh, continue the conversation and next turn it over to Sarah Coombs. She's the Director for Health System Transformation at the National Partnership for Women and Families. She manages policy and programmatic work on health access and system transformation, including health equity, health coverage and affordability, and payment and delivery system transformation. Prior to her work at the National Partnership, she worked in the office of the Secretary at the Department of Health and, health and Human Services, where she contributed to the policy development and implementation of the Affordable Care Act and delivery system transformation initiatives. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you for having me. And I have uh, very big shoes to fill um, after following uh, Sarah. Um, so yeah, thank you for including the consumer advocacy perspective in this conversation. The National Partnership for Women and Families is a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy advocacy organization based in DC. Um, among our core areas is um, promoting health system transformation efforts that foster 
uh, equity for patients and consumers. So a lot of the work that I do is more on the national federal level, but I think there are core elements or approaches that states can employ to promote equity and advancing primary care models um, that come to mind for me. And, I, and today I'm just going to highlight uh, three critical areas, and those are the importance of investing in small and community-based um, providers and safety net providers um, and, and investing in community engagement and uh, disaggregating data. Um, so prime, as Sarah noted, primary care plays a, a vital role in supporting efforts to achieve health equity, but um, payment and delivery system reform and primary care could widen inequities if not designed in a way to feasibly um, include safety net and trusted culturally congruent community providers. Uh, for women, particularly low-income women and women of color, safety net providers are vital sources of reproductive and sexual health care and primary care, which Sarah noted is ever more important in this climate. So we really have to think, uh, we really have to just shift our thinking in order to advance health equity. As I heard someone say in a recent webinar, it will require money to save money, uh, particularly in communities that have been systematically under-resourced and structurally disadvantaged. Um, financial incentives or nominal per member per month uh, fees only serve as a band-aid for safety net providers and small and community-based providers because advanced primary care models require high financial, technological, um, and personnel needs. And these providers are in, um, they're in a disadvantaged position to fund these new investments um, in care delivery. Therefore, um, states can really help ensure um, to help for states to help ensure a level playing field in the development um, and implementation of advanced primary care models. They should help by providing significant upfront investments to safety net providers um, uh, to account for wide disparities in the resources that um, these providers have at their disposal. Um, the second is community engagement. Um, in general, community engagement um, or communities in need of advanced primary care that um, effectively addresses their needs just have not simply been, um, they have simply not been meaningfully included in decision-making processes. Um, without meaningful participation um, of community members, particularly BIPOC and rural communities, um, LGBTQ individuals and individuals with disabilities and other you know, populations that um, experience inequities, uh, inequities can widen and decision-makers uh, could lack accountability. So addressing health inequities um, requires states, uh, MCOs, and, and providers to listen to and value the priorities and lived experiences of their members, their patients, and communities. Um, meaningful inclusion requires a multifaceted uh, approach uh, that grapples with um, structural imbalances in power, um, technical expertise, and dedicated resources. Um, states and MCOs, um, you know, could really think about formalizing community partnership processes that have buy-in from the very top, that are well-resourced, that are transparent, um, that engage community members early in decision-making. Um, you know, members will, in order for members to feel valued, they, they want to, you know, they want to know what is expected of them, what will be done with their input, and how it will all fit into the decision-making process. Um, it's, you know, it's important that consumers and community leaders um, feel that their concerns are, are valued equally with those that have like technical expertise and health industry um, uh, and other health, health industry representatives. Um, and as, as I mentioned, um, it, it's really important, um, you know, to, to get their feedback as early as possible in, in, in the process um, so that, you know, um, uh, Part, all parties can really engage in an equal basis. Um, it's also really important to pay attention to uh, power, like I said, power dynamics and hierarchy dynamics like meeting location, for example, that's a very powerful tool. 
Um, and equally as important is um, compensation for community members' uh, expertise and their time, um, as well as thinking about how to cover childcare or transfer transportation to really remove barriers um, to participation. Um, in terms of outreach and, and recruitment, um, states and MCOs should really consider partnering with um, community-based organizations who can serve as conduits to assist in recruiting um, community members to participate in engagement um, activities. Um, and so the last point that I really want to touch on is, is data collection and accountability. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of collecting and employing disaggregated data to um, underpin accountability at all levels, federal, state, MCOs, and provider level. Um, states and MCOs and providers um, really should focus on improving data collection so that we can identify inequities, target primary care interventions to improve them and track progress without, um, you know, without this data, inequities will uh, remain unseen and unaddressed. Um, state Medicaid agencies should really think about, um, you know, examining um, their data collection, their data collection practices. Um, in collecting data, the demographic data based on race, ethnicity, language, disability, SOGI, um, and other key and important demographic uh, information. Um, there are a number of data collection challenges. You know, it's not just um, the lack of standards, but also, you know, the mistrust from members about how their data is used. Um, and these are valid concerns about privacy and discrimination. Um, and this is really, this is a really good uh, example where community engagement is critical. Um, states and MCOs could conduct outreach to community-based organizations and, and leaders to understand why data are not being provided and to seek their input on how best to collect that data and to really think about how to partner um, and develop a, a tar targeted strategy to improve data collection. And, and so having data, like collecting the data is one thing and then using it for accountability to advance health equity is another. Um, as Sarah mentioned, performance uh, measurement um, is, is, is varied, right? And I think that um, advanced primary care models should really show the narrowing of outcome gaps to be considered like successful or to trigger incentives or bonuses or shared savings, um, just saving money without really knowing whether inequities have improved or worsened is just too low of a bar. Um, therefore, you know, states can require MCOs to stratify performance measures by population groups and, and require Require them to establish targets for reducing disparities and, and, and quality and other quality improvements. Um, and again, this is where um, states and MCOs can bring in the community um, where they can partner with them and inform uh, to help inform selection of, of performance measures. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to know, I, I completely agree with um, Sarah's point that payment models um, that recognize safety net providers as community health system anchors um, and rather than simply uh, patient-based payment incentives is critical. And that, that wraps my note, my uh, remarks. Thank you so much, Sarah. You have a beautiful way of really stressing the importance of community engagement. And I really like how you're, you know, we're broadening what accountability means. Um, it's not just accountability to state goals. It's accountability to individuals um, enrolled in Medicaid and, and communities. Um, so thank you so much for bringing those points home. Uh, next, we have a perspective um, from a state Medicaid agency. Perhaps there are other state Medicaid agencies in the office, um, uh, on the, on, in the audience. Uh, so we have Martha Farlow, and she is with MassHealth. She is the Deputy Director of Payment and Care Delivery Innovation, where she oversees a broad policy portfolio related to managed care programs. She develops and negotiates, negotiates MassHealth's proposed 1115 waiver extension request, which I think she's in the throes of right now, and designs and manages accountable care organization contracts and procurements. Additionally, Martha has led the development of MassHealth's primary care payment reform strategy, including supporting the development of a new subcapitation payment model to advance care delivery 
and move primary care away from fee-for-service uh, incentives. So a wonderful perspective here, thinking a lot about primary care, a lot about managed care accountability. And with that, I'll turn it to Martha. Thanks so much, Dana. And, and thank you, Sarah and Sarah, um, for your remarks. Gives me so much to think about from a state perspective. Uh, I want to highlight in particular a theme from um, from Professor Rosenbaum that I think you'll you'll hear through what I'm I'm planning to talk about around that tension between specificity and flexibility. I think that's something that we as a state grapple with every day. Where um, on the one hand, when we want to be really clear about our goals and clearly enforce member protections or where standardized data measurement is really important, there are a lot of advantages to a uniform implementation approach. Um, but on, on the other hand, we know that often our plans, in particular providers, are much closer to the communities that they served and can be more attuned to the unique needs of those communities. And we want to empower them to be innovative and responsive uh, and, and allow them to do the problem solving with their networks around their unique considerations. So I really appreciate uh, you raising that. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so MassHealth is Massachusetts's Medicaid agency. Uh, we currently serve about 2 million people. Uh, we run an 1115 demonstration waiver. Uh, our current demonstration waiver um, started in 2017 and runs through this year uh, and really made some significant uh, changes around our, our delivery system, restructuring it towards integrated value base and, and accountable care. Uh, so one of the biggest changes that we made was launching for the first time accountable care organizations uh, in our Medicaid program. Uh, we currently have 17 uh, accountable care organizations or ACOs uh, that represent large and small providers across the state. Uh, and, and they are accountable for both quality, including member experience uh, and total cost of care. Uh, currently about 80% uh, of members who are eligible to participate in an ACO are participating in an ACO, uh, which we are very excited about. Uh, and we are sort of at, a, at an inflection point here with our current waiver coming to an end um, and re-procuring our ACO program. So I'll talk a little bit today about both uh, some of the changes that we've made recently and what we're looking to do in the next five-year period. Um, just another key goal of the waiver that I wanted to, to call out here is um, we have been leveraging our waivers since their inception to support our safety net system. Um, and with this most recent implementation, have also started to align that accountability um, a little bit more with ACO participation and, and performance on some of the measures that matter to us. Next slide. So uh, a couple of key highlights around primary care and health equity that I wanted to share with folks today. Uh, so our ACO program uh, does attribution based on primary care enrollment. Uh, and the goal here is actually to empower primary care providers in their negotiations with plans to set them up so that plans are coming to primary care providers with uh, offers of financial workflow, operational support, et cetera, uh, to try to, to court the providers to join their plan, to put them in that position of being able to make that choice. Uh, we've seen in our preliminary data from the program, so again, we launched um, March of 2018, uh, so we are, are a few years in, and some of those years uh, were during a pandemic, so some, some interesting data coming out of that that we're trying to figure out how to evaluate and parse. Uh, but some of what we have seen preliminarily um, is a strengthened member connection to primary care, which we're very excited about. Um, so um, we saw in the first years of the program that for members that were enrolled in, uh, in ACOs, their primary care visits were actually 12% higher than for members that were not enrolled in ACOs. Uh, we also saw on the clinical quality side um, that we have generally high scores um, and we're starting to see an, an increase across a, a majority of measures, uh, but something to refine and continue to evaluate and continue to make sure that we have chosen uh, and are focusing on the right quality measures. Um, we are excited to have, like I said, really broad provider participation in our accountable care organizations. Um, nearly all of the FQHCs uh, in the state are participating. We actually have um, an FQHC-based ACO that some of you may be familiar with, a community care cooperative, um, that is bringing some really unique perspectives to how you run a, a managed care program. Uh, we, for the first time, have done a risk implementation or risk adjustment, excuse me, methodology that we're really excited about, uh, which is not a sentence that I think you usually hear in some of these conversations. 
um, wherein uh, our risk adjustment methodology for um, ACO and, and MCO capitation rates accounts not just for medical complexity and diagnostics, um, but for social complexity and risk. Because we know, for example, um, that a member with diabetes who has stable housing is going to have really different care needs and costs than a member with that same diagnosis who is experiencing housing instability uh, and having challenges in other areas of their life. Um, and then the, the last sort of piece to highlight from this, this current waiver demonstration program uh, is the creation of the Flexible Services Program. Uh, so that's um, a program where we are able to give ACOs dollars to partner with social services organizations to actually provide goods and, houses, um, goods and services um, for housing and nutritional supports to um, start to, to try to address more directly some of the social determinants of health that we know that, that our members in the Medicaid population uh, are experiencing. Uh, that program actually launched in January of 2020. Uh, which was an interesting time to launch a, a major program, as it turns out. Um, so that's one where we are now getting getting data and trying to evaluate um, what it looks like for a, a program that went on during the pandemic. And, and actually some of that program ended up pivoting and being focused around what do uh, Medicaid members need when they are quarantining? What do members need when they are new Medicaid members because they have recently lost employment? Um, and so there were some ways in which that, that timing, I think, ended up being a silver lining for us. Next slide. So we are currently, uh, as Diana mentioned, really in the throes of negotiating our next 1115 waiver. Uh, actually, our current one expires at the end of this month. So we've laid out um, five major goals that we're hoping to accomplish uh, with this next iteration that'll run through 2027. Uh, I won't go through all of these today, um, but just want to highlight two of them. Um, that second goal, that making reforms and investments in primary care, behavioral health, and pediatric care, is one that we have really doubled down on, uh, I think, in our, in our most recent proposal. Um, and then that, that goal three on advancing health equity, I think, has always been part of the fabric of what we do at Mass Health, but we have tried to be even more um, explicit and intentional around focusing on um, disparities related to health related social needs, maternal health, and, and health care for justice involved individuals. Next slide. So in the, in the primary care space, uh, we're proposing for 2023 going forward uh, for the first time having a, a primary care subcapitation uh, or capitation program, um, meaning instead of reimbursing visits fee for service, uh, where we know that we end up with providers sometimes feeling like they're on this 15 minute treadmill, uh, we're going to change payment to being a, a prospective capitation for a um, defined set of services and care. In addition to that changing how payment is made, uh, we're also investing $115 million a year in primary care on top of and above uh, primary care rates and payment today, uh, knowing that to see the kind of change that we want um, and to see the kind of care delivery that we know that our members need um, that is focused on population health, that has integrated behavioral health, um, that has some of the nuanced expertise and workflows around what kids and their families need and, and ability to address health-related social needs, um, that we'll, we'll need to leverage some of that investment to support practices in making some of those changes. Our hope over time is to see improved population level health outcomes from this program. Uh, by enabling primary care providers more flexibility to deliver care in a way that might look a little different than it does today. It may not always be an in-person 15-minute visit. Sometimes what, what a member needs may be health coaching um, or a discussion with a community health worker or a group visit wherein they have more of a chance to interact with peers who are going through the same thing. Um, and we, we know that generally our, our providers are better situated than we as Mass Health are to make some of those assessments on a, on a patient to patient level. Uh, ultimately, we're hoping that this leads to improved member experience as their providers are more flexible and responsive to their needs um, and ideally improved provider experience as well. We know there's a huge burnout crisis that's happening right now in primary care and we're hoping that some of this investment and flexibility will help to ease some of that on primary care providers. Next slide. Um, so I, uh, 
Sarah Coombs really, really appreciated the themes that you lay out around health equity. Uh, and I think very aligned with the places that we in Massachusetts are trying to go and, and some of the directions that we are aspiring to make moves in um, over the course of our of our next of our next waiver. Um, so a, a couple of the new initiatives that we're that we're implementing and that we're currently negotiating with CMS. Um, one is creating health equity incentive payments for ACOs. Uh, these are upside investments uh, that total about 1% of total cost of care uh, and hold ACOs and, and MCOs accountable for um, one, health equity strategic planning and community engagement, uh, meaning ensuring that our, that our plans have the right kind of uh, member engagement, member voice, um, and ability to ask their communities for feedback. Uh, two, around strengthening data collection. Uh, again, as, as Sarah talked about, uh, we know that there are huge gaps in the data that we have uh, about members, and we really want to make a push and an investment around getting disaggregated member level data um, around race, ethnicity, and language, but also disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity, because we know that there are health disparities and health inequities that occur along all of those lines. And if we want to know if our, um, if our in, uh, initiatives are making a difference, we need to be able to measure and assess what's working and what's not working. Uh, third is actually using that data in a meaningful way uh, to analyze and report on those disparities and attract them over time. Uh, and finally, as we get sort of towards performance year four and five, what we'll be looking to do is to tie that accountability to ac actually making changes and closing those gaps in health outcomes. Um, uh, in addition, we're also going to be continuing our flexible services program, uh, making some tweaks to it based on what we've learned, uh, in particular around um, some of the requirements that make it a little bit hard for children and their families to participate. Um, as the program is currently structured, acknowledging that the way that children access supports is, is through their families and needs to be set up uh, to allow for that. Uh, we're also pushing our, our managed care plans to increase the number of members who ultimately enroll in and get access to flexible services. Uh, in addition, we'll be introducing some new benefits uh, in the program that are community support programs um, targeting members who are at risk of homelessness, uh, either um, near that uh, at a point of experiencing homelessness and having some tenancy preservation intervention, um, or folks who are experiencing homelessness and cycling in and out of the healthcare system um, as, as high utilizers and trying to get them into a more stable place in their, in their housing and in their medical care. And then the, the last point that I wanna highlight here, because I wanna make sure that we've got some time for discussion, um, is a, a focus that we're that we have around individuals who are justice involved. Uh, we know this is a population that experiences some pretty significant health disparities. Uh, we've been looking at what would it mean to provide mass health coverage to individuals who are currently incarcerated just prior to their release. Uh, the goal in particular is to catch uh, populations coming out of incarceration in that first like two to four week period where we know um, there's a very high risk of negative health health outcomes, especially around overdose. And if we can get folks enrolled in care and connected to providers before they leave um, the facility that they're incarcerated in, we can hope to get them into care in a, a smooth and continuous manner and not have that break that sometimes leads to um, particularly negative outcomes around, around substance use. So with that, I'm gonna pause. Um, and turn it back over to Diana. Um, Dan, I'm really looking forward to reflecting more on these topics with you and our fellow panelists in the audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, our panelists can uh, turn their videos on. We can see all your beautiful faces again. Um, and we're gonna have a, a little bit of a discussion of what we heard, wonderful presentations. And something that struck me is that so much of this work um, is about partnership, you know, partnerships between states and MCOs, um, partnerships between MCOs and safety net providers, and then, you know, partnership with community as well. And we have a question from the audience here, I believe it's for Sarah Coombs, about how a safety net provider like an FQHC can perhaps more um, strategically engage MCOs in conversations about health equity targets and health equity work? 
Um, I think that's a great question. I, I do think that just as it's important for um, MCOs to engage their members, it's um, equally important to hear for them to hear from a, a, um, FQHCs um, to really understand their challenges and opportunities that payment reform and performance measurement um, reviews presents um, for them. Um, and so I think that for one, I think perhaps states could require this, require that not only that um, MCOs have, you know, a community engagement plan, but also an engagement plan that with their providers, how are they listening to um, the challenges and priorities of their providers? Um, I am curious, you know, whether or not uh, Martha might have um, share some examples, I don't know, at, at Mass, the Massachusetts, any one of the, you know, FQHCs that you've worked with. Yeah, I think that's a great question for Martha, because I believe you have a past life working with community <laughs> health centers as well. So very relevant. I do. Um, appreciate the, the challenges you raised, Sarah, and, the, and raised by this questionnaire. I think it depends a lot on the community and on the provider. Um, we find that sometimes as a Medicaid agency, we don't have the the resources or the bandwidth to have the number and breadth of conversations that we'd like to have, the number and breadth of providers that we'd like to. Um, and so often find a lot of leverage from advocacy and community organizations who are able to help consolidate some of the voices and help us prioritize the, the many different challenges that we're seeing. Uh, so I think that can be a really powerful way to, to get a message together. Um, so to work with some of those organizations. Can I just note, um, we have a, a, a study going on now at the Geiger Gibson program about health center negotiations with, uh, with plans. Uh, and um, uh, they, we, we, it's part of a study on alternative payment models. Uh, and uh, of course, we've had occasion, therefore, to drill deep on you know, how these negotiations are going, very interesting. And what seems to be, you know, um, there, there are two things that come through. One is that I think as Martha is suggesting and um, as Sarah has suggested, the state's expectations are real important here. If a state expects that there are going to be good working relationships between plans and safety net providers because both need each other very badly. Uh, the safety net provider's biggest source of revenue is Medicaid. The plan's biggest source of primary care is safety net providers. So, you know, this is like uh, the, the, fro the, the frog on the back of the scorpion or the scorpion on the back of the frog or something. They need each other. Uh, and so that's number one. Number two, um, I would say that all the negotiations we've discussed with, with health centers have been very successful. And it's a frank, quite frankly, a frank understanding about how big a role the safety net providers play in the success of the plan. Um, you know, it's not a negotiation about you should do the right thing, although that's certainly, you know, you, you need to do health equity work, we do health equity work. You need to have en engagement with patients, we have engagement with patients. But it's really a business proposition, uh, which is your the things you're expected to do, you know, plan are the things that we're expected to do as providers. Uh, and there's every reason in the world for us to work together. So it, it, it is um, a positive, um, a very positive working relationship that you hear over and over again, as opposed to a tension filled one. And I, I don't think there's a state that uses managed care where you would not find that without the safety net providers, it just would not be a feasible model. I'm reflecting on uh, Sarah Coombs' words about, you know, you need to spend money to save money. And certainly investment comes up often in this right. space. We just did a, a webinar on primary care investment. And I'm thinking about, um, of course, the primary care subcapitation model. But Martha, you know, something that's of continued interest to a lot of states um, is your risk adjustment methodology and how it can potentially be a vehicle to reallocate resources or um, allocate resources more appropriately. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the details there, um, assessment tool that is conducted 
and how ACOs are sort of using that added flexibility with the um, social risk adjustment to uh, contract with community-based organizations um, for uh, resources to address health-related social needs. Sure. And I, I want to be clear here because we, we use risk adjustment to mean a couple of things. So at the state level, we do a risk adjustment that takes into account, for example, example Z codes that indicate homelessness as well as medical complexity. Um, and that helps us adjust our capitation payments to um, managed care plans. Uh, we'll also use that going forward in our primary care um, subcapitation model, knowing that just because you see two members with the same diagnosis doesn't mean they require the same amount of care and, and investment and support. And so to try to do some adjusting there. Um, I'm also hearing in this question um, some interest around risk assessment. Um, so how does a plan look at its members and say who will need what and who will need care coordination? That's also something that's very exciting that I would love to talk about for a long time, but I'll, I'll focus on the risk adjustment to start. Um, I, I think it's uh, the, so the model we have, like I said, takes into account a couple of different factors that we collect. It's a model that we're continuously revising. Um, and, and there's some question about what, how do you know that your risk adjustment model has done what you want it to do? Do you want it to predict uh, spending perfectly? Do you want it to make some corrections because you think that historically actually some populations have received not enough care, um, in which case you want your risk adjustment model to actually sort of overcorrect in certain directions and say, you know, this population of members historically hasn't had access and so actually we should put more dollars there. Um, so I say it's, it's something that we are continuously refining um, and trying to work with the appropriate research and academic partners on to, to try to improve it. Um, it's, it's exciting in that it's somewhat of a novel approach, but it's, it's by no means perfect. And given that both, both Sarah's have been thinking about payment often um, and perhaps that intersection with social risk adjustment, anything to add or amplify uh, to Martha's comments there? No, I, I mean, I think I think Martha is spot on, uh, and um, Sarah, of course, has made some really good observations already about about payment reform. I mean, to say that safety net providers are eager to test out payment reform, I think, is the understatement of the century. Uh, they they have uh, uh, again because my work over a long, long time is focused heavily on community health centers. And I was the one who was involved in the development of the original payment model. Um, you know, what worked in 1990 and work still as a baseline, uh, you know, how to go about approaching rate setting um, uh, is first of all, it, 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 the situation has changed radically. In 1990, I think health centers cared for about seven or eight million people. They're up to 30 million people now. Uh, they, I was just comparing old and new health centers. Uh, the average old and new health center, it's, it's just stunning, uh, the difference. And um, the past several years have really battered them. Uh, and they have a big cliff coming when a lot of the special COVID pandemic money is going away. Uh, uh, and their baseline, you know, their grant funding is very, very limited compared to their overall budget. So whatever can be done with Medicaid to move toward an alternative payment model that improves revenue flow and takes some of the pressure off the providers uh, and lets them really focus on the things that Martha and Sarah have, ref you know, have referred to as, 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 as equity producing activities, which may not be a face to face encounter. Um, that's, that's the best. Sarah Coombs, anything to add before we wrap up? Sure. Just related to, to risk adjustment, um, I, I do know that there are states, and I don't know off the top of my head which ones, that are you know are using neighborhood level um, areas of, of um, indices, right? And so I think like area deprivation index, um, which reflects geographic levels of socioeconomic deprivation, um, and they are either using that alone or using it um, in combination with um, the individual level data. Um, and so I think there are states that are exploring what's the right approach. Um, and, and we haven't gotten it right yet, but um, I, I think uh, with more with more research and more and more time, we'll soon find what works best for you know unique states. 
Well, thank you. And with that, um, I just want to remind you that uh, for this webinar series, we have all of our different recordings on payment, um, on behavioral health, on health-related social needs, all at the intersection of primary care um, and health equity uh, available on our website for download. We also have that toolkit, which has you know all those different state examples of contract language and RFP language. Um, thank you so much to our panelists today. It was an amazing discussion and really, really um, uh, important work um, in Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Be so well. Much. Bye. Bye.